Chapter 48, Academy Days Part 6, Shinobi Union Chapter 3 Hayuga Household Hanabi is sitting Siza style in her family personal training ground, her feet tucked in under her butt, her hands placed on her knees. She remains motionless, calm, alert. Despite her eyes themselves being closed, the popping veins around her eyes suggest more to her than her demeanor might have one believe. A feather, as fast as a kunai, flies directly at her head. She emits a light burst of chakra that knocks the feather mid-air, causing it to lose all of its momentum and slowly sway to the ground, among dozens of other feathers. Oh wow. Katori watches in awe. She just keeps knocking them down. How? Hiyashi calmly sips his tea, sitting in the same Siza style as Hanabi. That is the way of the Hayuga. We've perfected our control of chakra Moreso than any other. With the aid of the Byakugan we've been able to study the flow of chakra to a greater degree than anyone and have used that knowledge to. She stops, seeing that Katori has stopped paying attention and has continued throwing feathers at Hanabi, which all get deflected. He sighs, exasperated. Hinata chuckles and pats her father on the back. I believe you'll find Katori similar to Naruto in many regards. I'm beginning to notice. He says in a tired voice. So this is something only the Hayuga can do? Katori asks, not having stopped listening as Hiyashi may have thought. You need the Byakugan for it? Technically speaking, no. Hiyashi answers, slightly impressed that she's taking such a great interest. We're able to use it more easily because we can see the flow of chakra, so we can easily adjust our output. Anyone can learn the skill, they simply have to rely on their instincts. However, that has led to many permanently damaging their chakra system. Katori gulps. So best not to do that. Unsupervised, no. Hiyashi corrects her. If you can find a Hayuga willing to help you learn, then. Katori smiles widely looking between him and Hinata. So, you mean I can? Hinata raises a brow. Do you mean you're allowing Katori to learn the Hayuga clan's secrets? Hiyashi delays his response with another sip of tea. He's definitely doing this on purpose. She is your daughter, is she not? It is your duty to teach her and pass down your knowledge. He almost spills his tea when Katori abruptly hugs him. Thanks, Grandpa. Hiyashi does his utmost to keep a straight face. He utilizes the many years of being head of the most prestigious clan, years of service on the battlefield. However, even his once cold demeanor can't hold back the smile that creeps across his face. Him trying to fight that smile only makes his face funnier. Hinata giggles. Father. In contrast to her sister, from her spot in the yard, Hanabi begins laughing uncontrollably. Hiyashi grabs the plate his cup had been resting on and flings it at Hanabi like a shuriken. The young heiress grabs it, rather than repelling, and opens the eyes, some tears of laughter flowing down her cheeks. He stands up and wipes her eyes, compassing herself. Katori only now lets go of her adoptive grandfather. You won't regret it, grandpa. I'll train super hard, harder than Jiriki. She declares. Hiyashi coughs, trying to compose himself as well. Since you're part of the family, you must refer to me as grandfather when others are around. Okay. Katori nods. Hanabi walks over and places the plate back where it belongs. Still trying to act tough, father? Come now, Hanabi. Hinata giggles despite herself. Be mindful of father's feelings. I trust you're prepared for the Chunin exams tomorrow? Hiyashi tries to change the subject. Hanabi nods firmly. I am. I'll win no matter the cost. Good. Hiyashi stands up and straightens his robes. We will have one final session later, and then you're to rest until the morning. Now, if you'll excuse me, I've matters to attend to. He nods to the three girls and makes his way inside. Do you really think you can win? Katori asks. Naturally. Hanabi puffs out her chest with pride. I'm the heiress of the Hayuga clan, after all. Even among eleven villages, no one can match me. Be careful, Hanabi. Hanada warns. Confidence and arrogance are not far away from one another, and it's not always clear towards which you're headed. Don't worry, I'm fully aware of what I say. Hanabi reassures her sister. Katori scratches her cheek. Hmm. But Konohimaru says he's definitely gonna win, too. Can two people win? Hanabi's eye twitches. That little? She can feel her voice rising just thinking about him. Listen, what my sister said is true. I have confidence in my abilities, but Saratobi is arrogant. He can't see things clearly. He has no chance. You sound oddly passionate about this? Hinata smirks, becoming suspicious of just how opinionated Hanabi is about her peer. He's been a thorn in my side for a while now. Always appearing when I least suspect him, with that dumb grin on his face. Maybe I'll get the chance to finally shut him up. Why don't you two like each other? Katori asks. He's just. Hanabi grumbles, 
difficult, always getting in my way. Katori looks at Hinata, confused. He didn't seem that way. Hinata pats her on the head. They just have a lot of things to work over, the two of them. Hanabi crosses her arms. Let's just not talk about him. Let's talk about Naruto, where is he? Hinata smiles. With Konohimaru, Hanabi slumps her shoulder. Just can't win. Saratobi household. Konohimaru hops in place, getting pumped up. He swings his arms, punching the air, and finishes with a high kick. And that's how I'm gonna win, he declares. Naruto laughs. Got it all planned out, huh? You bet. The boy gives a thumbs up. Genzai looks unconvinced. I really doubt it's going to play out like that. Oh ye of little faith. Konohimaru poses dramatically. You believe in me, right? He turns to look at two adults in particular. Of course, son. Tosaku says. Thank you. Konohimaru firmly nods. I just don't believe in this plan of yours. Tosaku adds. Konohimaru slumps his shoulders. From the seat next to the Saratobi clan head, Kurunai chuckles. I'm sure you'll be fine. Mirai waddles up to her cousin and hugs his leg. I believe, Kanemaru. Konohimaru tears up and picks up the toddler. You're a bright light in this home, Mirai. If only I had a sibling like you. He holds her up to his chest. She giggles at the affection she's being showered in. Hey. Genzai plays the role of the offended, knowing his brother is only joking. Naruto laughs and stands up to go up to Kanemaru, clapping him on tea back. If you got a plan, then I'm sure it'll work. You know it. I got something up my sleeve that'll really leave you speechless, boss. The boy grins. You'll be all woe, Konohimaru, you're so awesome. So awesome. Mirai raises her hands in cheering. Yep, just like that. Konohimaru laughs. Naruto grins. All right. I'll be waiting for this surprise of yours. Just so you know, I'm the king of surprises so I expect something good. He adds as a joke. Don't worry it will be. Might not be at the first fight tomorrow, but it'll come. Konohimaru gives a thumbs up, mimicked by Mirai. Hidden Leaf Arena And the crowd goes wild. By far the largest gathering this arena, or any arena, has ever seen. The first time that 11 villages have gathered in one place for peaceful reasons, and it shows in just how packed the place is. It's larger than the old one, but still hardly enough to fit everyone. Some modifications in the form of earth style and a bit of wood style had to be made to accommodate more people, but they managed to do it. The five Kage and six village leaders, as usual, have their own designated spot that overlooks the entirety of the arena. They sit at a table with one advisor each standing behind them. Kakashi Hataka, Derui, Kankuro, Kuritsuchi, and Shijuro for the five great villages. All throughout the audience seats, most people of import have found their places. Many of the clan leaders have managed to group up. That includes Naruto Uzumaki, Hiyashi Hayuga, and Tasaku Saratobi, and relevant personages. Hinata, Kurinai and Mirai, and the kids are present to cheer, as well. Katori, Jiriki, Genzai, Kashiwama, along with Kagatsu and Teshin families who, thanks to Naruto, were granted seats usually reserved for VIPs. Itasuke Teshin tries to appear calm in these surroundings. To be present at Chunin exams. I'd given up on the idea of the Teshin clan being present, and yet here we are. Hiashi looks to him from the corner of his eyes. And once your boy graduates, your clan will participate once more. Is that something you wish to see happen, Lord Hiashi? Itasuke puts on his best poker face. Naturally. Hiashi answers without delay. The Teshin clan were admirable rivals. It's a shame your forefathers chose to end their careers. I look forward to your son showing what made the empty hand so revered as a fighting style. Itasuke's poker face drops to reveal the confusion he feels underneath. Ah, thank you? Yoikagatsu Pav Yoikagatsu looks around in awe. I don't think I've seen this many people in one place before. It's somewhat nerve-wracking. Gurin laughs. If you think it's bad now, wait until Yakimaru's the one down there fighting. That's, Yoi expression turns to mild panic. I still don't even think I've come to terms with that. She looks over to her son who's up by the railing along with his friends and classmates, future teammates and rivals. Are they also going to fight each other in the future, despite being on the same side? Naruto turns around in his chair to address her. You got nothing to worry about, auntie. A lot of my best friends are people I fought against. I can promise the Chunin exams will only make them closer. Hinata Pav Hinata leans over to fawn over the young Mirai sitting in Kurinai's lap. Are you excited, Mirai? 
The toddler looks up and nods more times than she needs to, rocking her hair. She then points to the arena. Kohimaru. Hinata follows to where Mirai is pointing. Yes, Konohimaru will be there. Will you cheer for him? Yay. Mirai puts her hands up above her head and claps. Cheer on Kanemaru. Win. Hinata laughs. She's grown so much. She was so small when Naruto and I left. Kurinai smiles. She has. She's at the age where she's much more active, too. Once this is all over, I can come spend more time with her. Hinata offers. You really don't need to. Kurinai smiles. I know you've been really busy with your new position, and it'll probably get busier with the expanding union. That, and you have your own family now. Yes, I suppose I do. Hinata looks back to Naruto sat next to her, engaged in conversation with the others around them. Family, Mirai cheers. When the time arrives for the exams to start, each qualified team from each village lines up in the arena, ready to receive instructions from the proctor, Genma Shiranyui. He delivers the speech in his usual laid-back tone with a toothpick between his lips. He looks at all of the teams gathered. Eleven in total, one from each village. Thirty-three Genin. This is by far the largest gathering since the founding of the hidden villages. Because of the sheer size, the preliminaries were held at each respective village, and only a single team came out on top to take part in the final exam. The tournament. For the Hidden Leaf, it's actually a mixed team. Konohamaru Saratobi, Mogi Kazamatsuri, and Hanabi Hayuga. From the sidelines, Ibisu cheers them on along with Yuten Ice, the currently only Chunin from Team Ibisu. Samui is nearby, as well, but much less vocal than her Leaf colleague when it comes to supporting her Genin. Genma begins the explanation. This final part of the Chunin exams, as is tradition, will take the form of a tournament. Thirty of you will fight one-on-one, -on -one, while three randomly selected will fight in a three-way. The only manipulation on our part will be that those three must be from separate villages. And due to the sheer number, the arena will be split into three smaller sections. He signals the shinobi on standby at certain intervals of the arena. The shinobi all go through the same hand signs. Four violet flames formation. Purple translucent walls emerge from the ground and, as advertised, split the arena in three parts. Small opening on the walls allow the genin to go to their designated sections. Genma continues the explanation. You're to fight until either or both are unable to continue or one of you forfeits. Deliberate attempts at killing will not be tolerated. He scans the present genin to ensure the information sunk in. And now for the draws. Genma motions to the large screen on the side of the arena. The names of all 33 Genin flash across several times before each of them are paired with their opponent. The very first fight will have Konohamaru going up against a hidden waterfall Genin. He quickly scans all 16 matches to see where the people he knows are. The first name he spots is Hanabi's, who's more to the center brackets. If they wind all their matches, they'd face all the way in the semi-finals. Mogi is in the second half, meaning the only way Konohamaru would fight her is in the finals. The name that sticks out to him is Yumai, the Cloud Genin who talked smack to him before. She's in the very final fight. The three-way. The odds are against her, she might not be able to go up against two other opponents. For many people in the audience, this is their first time ever encountering the Hidden Star's mysterious peacock method. A special form of chakra manipulation that was born of a celestial body that fell long ago. Even though the meteorite was lost seven years ago, their chakra remained, and they were able to master and mold their own chakra to achieve this special technique on their own. It was only possible through intense study and training, but this chakra manipulation is perhaps unparalleled among the hidden villages. 16th Finals During the first rounds, all of the Leaf Genin managed to win, advancing to the next stage. Konohamaru displayed skills that not many people had seen, not even Naruto. The young boy fought with an impressive and unorthodox taijutsu, taught to the Saratobi clan, and burned his opposition with fire-style ninjutsu. Mogi proved skillful with her combination of water and earth styles, while Hanabi showed everyone why the Hayuga are one of the most respected shinobi clans. To Konohamaru's combination of annoyance and delight, Yumai won her three-way and she did so with relative ease. Unexpectedly, that fight was the shortest of them all. Her lightning-style fried her opponents and allowed her to come out relatively unscathed. With only 16 contestants now left, the winners are treated by the medical staff present. Sakura specifically makes sure to double and triple check everyone's health before they get sent back outside. Once they're cleared to continue, she goes to double check that the 17 who lost their fights are also in good health. Similarly, Hana Inuzuka tends to the health of the non-human participants. 
The Nekamata clan of the Hidden Mountain fight with their companion felines, and the Aramaki clan of the Hidden Stone fight with their frill-necked lizards. Both of the beasts must also be in top shape for the next stage. 8 Finals Among the remaining 16, Konohamaru and Hanabi manage to win their fight. Konohamaru faces again and from the hidden sand using wind style, but Konohamaru eventually overpowers them, while Hanabi fights a hidden star Genin using the peacock method. It takes her a while to get accustomed to the strange chakra that surrounds the whole body, but her gentle fist is able to defeat it. Mogi, unfortunately, falls in this bracket to one of the hidden cloud Genin, unable to stop their lightning. Ibisu tries to console his sulking student. You mustn't fret, Mogi. Losing a fight doesn't mean you won't become a Chunin. Yuta nods. Yeah. You did good. Not good enough. Mogi hangs over the railings overlooking the arena. So many shinobi here, all of them the best in their village. She sighs. Should have known I had no chance. You were lucky to get promoted last year, Yudin. Quarterfinals. Eight Genin remaining. Four fights. They all get a day of rest after the 16th finals and 8th finals to rest up and be on their best. Some had more strenuous matches than others, and they're still not in top shape. Kanemaru wins his fight against a hidden sand puppet user which he does with some difficulty. Hanabi manages to win against a hidden star Genin who surprised everyone by making it this far. Most everyone was certain the five great villages, but the ever-reclusive star got to the top eight, showing off they're not to be underestimated. Hanabi fights against a mist swordsman, which is a particularly bad matchup for him as he seems to specialize in stealth, using the hiding in mist jutsu which the Byakugan sees right through. He does prove proficient with swords alone, but eventually Hanabi overpowers him. Yumai actually has to fight one of her own teammates, and they do put up a good fight, both of them wanting to be the one to make it to the end and show off just what they can do. At the end, however, Yumai proceeds to the top four. The final Genin is one Shero Aramaki from the Hidden Stone defeats a Hidden Mist Genin, with the help of her companion Frill-Necked Lizard, not unlike the Inuzuka's canines and the Nekamata's felines. Those are the one to fight for the semi-finals and final, the ones who overcame all their obstacles so far. After a brief intermission to allow them enough time to recover, the semi-finals begin. Shinobi Union, Chunin Exams Semi-Finals Konohamaru Sarato Konohamaru smirks. Guess we won't have to wait long to see how I'll beat. I'm at least glad I'll kick you out of the exams sooner rather than later. Hanabi remarks. Genma looks at both contestants, ensuring they're at the proper distance from each other. Without taking out the toothpick off his lips, he lists off the rules of the bout. You may use any and all tactics you deem fit, any and all tools at your disposal. Deliberate murder will not be condoned. You will fight until either one of you forfeits or is unable to fight. Understood? He looks to both of them for confirmation. Konohamaru and Hanabi both nod. Genma raises his hand and brings it down in a swift motion, begin, and flickers away. Konohamaru wastes no time in bringing his fingers in a very familiar seal. Shadow clones, four doppelgangers spring into existence in a puff of smoke, and before that smoke can even settle, they've thrown shuriken at Hanabi. Two shuriken for each Konohamaru, the projectiles come at her from different paths, having been thrown to curve mid-air. This, however, is not something that would faze her. This, however, is something she's more than prepared for. She takes her stance and knocks each shuriken to the ground by blasting it with a burst of chakra from her palms. One blow hand, while she focuses on that, despite how briefly she did, the shadow clones run in to engage her in melee. Hanabi manages to expertly weave between their punches and kicks, delivering a powerful blow to their bodies that disperses them. Such an uninspired start. Hanabi mocks. Are you sure you don't want to save us time and forfeit now? I'm just getting started. Konohamaru declares. He pulls out two shuriken from his pouch and aims them right at her. Hanabi narrows her eyes. I deflected ten easily, how are two going to help? She once again prepares to render these useless as she did the previous batch. When they get close, Konohamaru smirks and begins to weave his chakra. Two, count again. Shuriken shadow clones, the two shuriken turns into dozens, duplicate after duplicate filling the space around Hanabi. There's no way she can deflect this many, even if she uses a one-blow body this time. They're way too close for comfort and they're only getting closer. She shifts her feet. There's one way to get out of this one. She extends her hands forward and back and begins violently spinning, releasing chakra from every chakra point in her body. The shuriken hit a sphere of pure chakra, one of the Hyuga clan's most dangerous techniques. 
revolving heaven. Once all the shuriken clatter to the ground, she stops her rotation and immediately darts toward the slack-jawed Konohamaru. Going from spinning to running forward is definitely something she's not yet used to. Before she reaches Konohamaru, she stumbles a bit which throws her off for the first few strikes. He uses those precious seconds to try and get more distance between them. He ducks, jumps, hops, and all around uses a very unpredictable fighting style to stay away from his opponent. Hanabi growls. Stop jumping around like a monkey? He grabs a smoke bomb from his pouch and throws it up between the two of them. Smoke blows up in both their faces, forcing Hanabi to back off. More like a weasel. She clicks her tongue. As she begins to focus her chakra to her eyes, a figure she never would have expected to see appears in front of her. Hiyashi Hayuga flickers to the arena and stands in front of Hanabi with a frown on his face. Enough, Hiyashi roars in anger. You've given a lackluster display of your abilities. You should have already won and yet you choose to disgrace me like this. No more. Hanabi stares at him in disbelief. No, father, I'm. Her voice shakes with fear over how she's disappointed her father. It's then that she sees the stands behind her father, where she sees that her father is still sitting in the audience. Then who is? Hiyashi pulls out a kunai and slashes at her. Hanabi manages to dodge several swipes, but he nicks her across the cheek, taking a few strands of hair. In the combination of taijutsu and kunai, the fake Hiyashi gets in a few solid hits, before Hanabi gets her rhythm back and strikes her fake father. In a puff of smoke, Hiyashi is revealed to be Konohimaru, a shadow clone, at that, that disappears when struck in the chest. You bastard. She shouts with a voice full of anger, the veins around her eyes popping, only now activating her Kekei Genkai. By Akugin. Meanwhile at Tribune. Naruto, as does everyone around him, looked stunned at what just transpired. They all look forward and try not to look at the head of the Hyuga sitting with them and how he marry act. Hiyashi, arms crossed, gives an approving nod. An impressive tactic. A bead of sweat drops on Naruto's brow. Wait, he enjoyed that? Back to fight. From the smoke that still fills a small part of the arena, something juts out with great speed. Hanabi, with her Byakugan activated, sees it coming and manages to push it away with a burst of chakra from both hands. What looks like an overly long staff retracts back into the smoke. Hanabi narrows her eyes. So you're done playing games, then, I was never playing. Konohamaru's voice comes from inside the cloud. The smoke begins to violently disperse, revealing Konohamaru wielding a black bow staff, spinning it over his head to get rid of the smoke. When he does, he takes a battle stance, prepared for battle. You're the one who didn't bother using her by Akigan sooner. Konohamaru stares her in her pale eyes. And you'll regret I ever did. She declares. You're really intense today, huh? Konohamaru chuckles. You ready for this, Enra? He asks seemingly no one in particular. For sure. The staff actually responds. Without bothering to even get closer, Konohamaru swings the staff. It expands far enough to reach Hanabi and wide enough where it leaves a massive dent in the ground when it comes crashing down. Hanabi dodges the strike, releasing bursts of chakra where necessary to block incoming attacks, but the speed at which the staff is being swung, combined with its unpredictable changes in size. It's very annoying. The crowd's cheering intensifies. Hanabi inches her way closer and closer, but it's taking a while. Her opponent has the advantage of being both at melee and in range at the same time, forcing her to focus on several elements. After a few moments of fending off the staff, Hanabi reconsiders her approach. She's been focusing on one person when she actually has two opponents right now. The monkey summons, despite their ability to shift into a weapon, have a chakra system like anyone else. She bides her time. Keeps benign on the defensive, waiting for Konohamaru to make a more decisive strike. When he does. Two palms, she strikes Enra twice, causing him to cry out in pain. He tries to revert, but his chakra is jostled, and so it does not happen right away as it usually does. It would have taken a second to regain his bearings, but Hanabi won't give him that much time. Four palms, another two strikes. She moves closer to Konohimaru, continuing to strike at Enra's pathway. Eight palms, Konohimaru tries to swing Enra, but his disrupted chakra means his toughness has lessened, and he's much more unwieldy now. Sixteen palms, Enra's no longer able to keep up his transformation, returning to his original form of a small primate right in front of Konohimaru. Hanabi continues her rampage, flickering next to them to finish her assault. 32 palms, with this barrage, Enra disappears. Hanabi, however, does not stop, now focusing the final strikes on Konohimaru, who's trying to scurry away from having his chakra shut off. 
That would be the end of this fight. 8 trigrams. 64 palms. With the first strike, Konohamaru is replaced with a particularly large rock that shatters when struck by the gentle fist. Hanabi turns to Konohamaru, having seen where he substituted to with her widened range of vision. Hanabi smirks. You keep being on the defensive. This isn't like you at all. Bit expert on me, huh? You a fan? He brings his hands together, weaving more chakra. I'll give you an autograph later. He inhales deeply. Fire style? Fire dragon flame bullet. He breaths out, releasing an intense stream of flames. You don't get it, do you? Hanabi brings her arms to her side, ready to thrust forward. The moment I saw how your chakra moved, I knew what you were going to do. You can't catch me off guard, Saratobi. She envelopes her hands in chakra and thrusts them forward. Gentle fist. Vacuum palm, the gust of chakra meets the fire midway. The two jutsu clashing causes a violent reaction like a fiery tornado that still manages to reach both of them. Hanabi skids to her feet to escape the flame. Konohamaru and a single shadow clone run directly through the fire before it can even begin to die down. He's not entirely defenseless, however, as he has a way to keep the fire at bay. A jutsu that works to such an intensity that it creates a small bubble of wind around the user. A sphere of pure concentrated chakra swirls within his palm, keeping him safe from the fire's full heat. Rasengan, seeing this, Hanabi immediately reacts by releasing chakra from every single chakra point in her body. Revolving heaven, two jutsu that release chakra in its pure form, that rely on an intense spinning motion to violently bludgeon opponents. One more user for offense and the other for defense. They clash, both fighting hard to overpower the other. In the end, however, the two jutsu prove an even match. The Rasengan and Revolving Heaven explore in a burst of chakra that sends them both flying away and falling on their backs. The crowd once again cheers. Hanabi is the first one to get up, but Konohamaru doesn't even try. Instead, he sends in his army. Shadow clones, four Konohamaru's run to engage in combat, while the real one regains his composure. The clones do a better job of keeping their distance, playing defense with their unorthodox fighting style, so as to not be dispersed too early. The real Konohamaru joins the fight soon enough. He knows far too well that even if a Hyuga misses, they can still affect you with their chakra, so he stays back and tries to lure her into a mistake, to find any sort of opening in her gentle fist. However, he finds no such opening, no matter how much the shadow clones. Even when she hits a clone to poof it out of existence, he summons a new one to take its place. This goes on for a while with Hanabi slowly but surely gaining momentum. She shows no sign of slowing down or becoming tired. The clones go away faster and faster, and Konohamaru is running out of chakra using this method of trying to overpower her. Eventually, Hanabi slides between the clones and manages to strike Konohamaru's palm, cutting off his chakra. He tries to step back, but Hanabi stays on him like glue. She strikes his arm a couple more time, rendering it limp. Another strike to the stomach sends him to the ground. The shadow clones all disperse at once. The crowd stands on edge, anticipating the end of the fight. It's over. You can't use your chakra, can't even use your favorite shadow clones or any other jutsu. Konohamaru stands up despite the pain, holding his stomach with his one remaining good hand. You really showing your colors today, huh? Konohamaru chuckles. Forfeit. Hanabi says coldly. Rather not. Konohamaru takes a battle stance. Never gonna give up. I'll fight right to the end, so don't you underestimate me. Hanabi narrows her eyes and darts right for him. She surrounds her palm and chakra, ready to expel it from her chakra point. She's assured in her victory. Even if he can move a little bit, he's in no shape to move as he did before, and he's definitely in no shape to use ninjutsu. Despite all of that, however, the fire in his eyes has not dwindled. Konohamaru is still going at her with as much intensity as he did before. They get closer to each other, ready to strike. Hanabi's plan is simple. Disable his right hand just like she did with his left and finish closing all of his remaining chakra points. That plan, however, is about to change. I told you, as they both swing to strike at each other, Konohamaru weaves chakra around his palm. Violent and swirling, it gathers into a sphere that sends his the dust around him flying away, not to underestimate me. Hanabi's eyes widen in shock. He can use it in one hand. Rasengan, it's too late for her to move her hand. She can't stop herself. If she gets hit by that, Three years ago. Excuse me? Hanabi knocks on the doorframe. May we speak? She hesitates but asks the question she came here to ask. The long-haired figure, back turned to the door, places a parchment back on the table, and turns to greet her. Of course, Lady Hanabi. Neji smiles. How may I assist you? 
She enters the room with an uncertain step, taking a seat opposite Neji. It's about the revolving heaven. She speaks directly. I hope to ask you for advice in mastering it. Neji raises the brow. Are you not learning it under Lord Hiashi? I am, however. She looks shyly to the ground. I'm having a difficult time grasping it. You'd already mastered it when you were my age, a feat not many have been able to accomplish. I see. So you're intent on mastering it as well, naturally. It's one of our most prized techniques and an impenetrable defense unlike any other. If I'm to succeed father as clan head. Neji chuckles and stands up, going around the table toward the screen door that leads into the yard. He opens it, letting the sunshine in. It's certainly a remarkable technique, but impenetrable it is not. How about I first teach you of its shortcomings? Hanabi cocks her head. Would that aid in its learning? Maybe it will, or maybe it won't. However, going into training with a misconception such as that would definitely be dangerous. Please, come with me. He walks outside into the open space. Hanabi follows, intrigued by what he'd have to say. The main thing about the revolving heaven is the control it requires. It unleashes a powerful force of chakra that violently spins, both protecting and attacking. Neji explains. Hanabi continues to look confused. Yes, I'm aware. That's precisely what makes it so powerful. However, impenetrable it is not. While it's true that there are few ways to counter it, there are ways. Could you extend your hands for me? Hanabi does as instructed and Neji does the same as well. With the violent motion, if it's met by something of equal power, it will be unable to keep up its momentum. Neji moves his hand to meet Hanabi's. Try to push my hand away. She does but he resists. Neither of them budge. With two opposing forces, especially when something like the revolving heaven is involved, the result can be catastrophic. However, with Hanabi still applying force to try to move his hand, Neji very swiftly moves his hand which causes the young girl to slightly lose her balance. He then moves his other hand to push Hanabi's hand away, forcing her to stumble. Rather than opposing it, if it's pushed to go beyond its limit, the jutsu will break. But what could even do that to the revolving heaven? Hanabi asks. And to begin with, how does any of this help with learning it? If you know a jutsu's weakness then you'll know how to properly use it, and perhaps even apply that knowledge elsewhere. Every jutsu has its weaknesses, and that is the revolving heavens. Neji nods and walks back to his room. Hanabi stands still where she's been until now and stares. I feel like I learned nothing. She mutters to herself. Back to fight. Hanabi reels back as the Rasengan inches ever closer. It's just as Neji said. When the Rasengan and Revolving Heaven hit, they were both blasted away. The Jutsu cancelled each other out. When it comes right down to it, the Rasengan is like a miniature version of the Revolving Heaven, which means, rather than meeting it with an equally opposing force, Hanabi stands firm, planting her feet in the ground. She gathers chakra at the palm of her hand and thrusts it forward. Right at the Rasengan. Kanahamru's eyes white as she does this. He expected she might have time to react, but he never would have expected this reaction. He's already mid-swing, he can't avert the Rasengan now. But if it hits her hand directly, there's no telling how severe the injuries will be. Still, Hanabi looks like she has no intention of backing out now. She steals herself and clashes directly with the Rasengan. Or rather, directly isn't the right word. She's gathered an impressive amount of chakra at her palm, large enough to create a barrier that protects her from the brunt force of Konohameru's jutsu. It's not as violent as the Rasengan, but her own chakra is spinning, as well. Spinning enough where it can boost the opposing jutsu enough to where its user can no longer control. Break! Hanabi shouts. And the Rasengan breaks. By adding to its motion, instead of trying to match it, the jutsu spun out of Konohameru's control, leaving the Saratobi off guard and off balance. Hanabi strikes immediately. She hits his palm and forearm. Then his biceps, shoulder, stomach. A blur of hits that he has no time to react to, that the audience can barely even keep up with. 8 trigrams. 64 palms. When the final hit lands, Konohameru stumbles back and coughs out blood before collapsing to the ground. She doesn't ease her battle stance, however, staying ready just in case he has something else up his sleeve. When he shows no signs of getting back up, Genma flickers on the field. The winner, Hanabi Hayuga. He declares the battle is over. Oh man. Genzai throws up his hands and throws himself back to his seat, having been on his feet for the entirety of the battle. Jiriki smirks next to him. It was the natural outcome. Hiashi turns to Tasaku. Kanohimaru has grown into an excellent shinobi. Had it been anyone besides a Hayuga that he fought, he tries to reassure his comrade. Tasaku nods. 
Hanabi has grown, as well. I'm sure Konohamaru will be pouty for a few days, but will get back to his feet. It's how he always is. Naruto stares in disbelief. She cancelled the Rasengan? She can do that? You can do that? He turns to Hinata. Can you do that? Hinata shakes her head, in just as much shock as him. No. I had no idea she could do that. Katori looks between the two of them. Was that impressive, what she did? Naruto nods. The Rasengan's a pretty powerful jutsu. It's not like it can't be stopped, but I've never seen anything like what Hanabi did. From the side, Kurunai chuckles. It's certainly a surprise. Just goes to show how careful you should be with your jutsu. I guess it's like Itachi said. Every jutsu has a weakness. Shoulder expected that counts for the Rasengan, too. Naruto looks down to his palm, gathering a small amount of swirling chakra. Hinata stands from her seat, placing a hand on Naruto's shoulder to get his attention. I'm going to go down to Hanabi. Naruto nods and stands up, as well. I'll come, too. I got a low Oata questions. Father? Hinata turns to her well, you know. Hiashi answers without turning his head. I'll come congratulate her once I witness who her opponent will be. Arena Infirmary Natsu Hayuga frets over Hanabi as she receives treatment. Ever since the heiress was a toddler, Natsu has been tasked with caring for her well-being and making sure no harm was to befall her. Even after coming of age, Hanabi never did take on the regular duties that most other shinobi did. Her missions were mostly diplomatic, and any fighting was on a small scale and easily handled. This is the first time Hanabi has been this injured. Her left hand, that took the Rasengan, is heavily bruised and already turning blue. She winces and hisses in pain as Sakura's mystic palm touches her skin, trying her best to not be too loud, not to pull back her hand. Trying her best not to appear weak. Sakura sighs. I don't know what you did, but it was certainly reckless. The coat of chakra protected you to an extent but. She takes the girl's hand and looks it over once more. Releasing even further chakra for you 64 palms definitely didn't help. Hanabi lowers her head. Will I be able to fight in the finals? Natsu looks at her in distress. Lady Hanabi. You needn't push yourself further. You can forfeit the finals. You displayed your abilities already, if you push yourself. Natsu. Hanabi cuts her off, still with her head lowered and focusing on her hand. If I was just going to give up, I may as well have allowed Konohimaru to win. I can't disgrace my village or my clan like this. Or him. She lifts her head to look Sakura in the eyes. So, doctor, will I be able to fight in the finals? Sakura sighs. So headstrong. I'd almost think you were related to Naruto instead of Hinata. It's a pretty serious injury. Even if I heal it to the best of my ability, it won't be in the best shape to fight. But it will be in a shape to fight? Hanabi asks for clarification. It will. Sakura nods. Lady Hanabi. Natsu whines, knowing her words would only fall on deaf ears. At this point, there's a knock on the door. Sakura calls out for whoever it is to enter, and Naruto and Hinata do just that. Hanabi. Hinata walks over and kneels in front of her sister, next to Sakura. She only then notices just how bruised her hand is. Why your hand? Yeah, it's nothing serious. Hanabi waves it off. It's quite serious. Sakura corrects her. But it will heal in due time. That was one hell of a feat you pulled there. Naruto chuckles. Don't think I've seen anyone block the Rasengan like that. And you can see the results. Sakura motions to the bruised hand. It was reckless but not something you really come up with in the heat of the moment. Hinata notes. Have you been training to fight Konohimaru? I mean, kind of, I suppose. Hanabi looks down. In the heat of the moment, I remember something Neji once told me about the revolving heaven's weakness. I just applied that on a smaller scale to the Rasengan. Hinata looks at her in surprise. Neji did? Yeah. In the moment, the two jutsu looked so alike, I remembered his words. Must have been good words. Naruto smiles. Hanabi bursts out laughing. It was actually nonsense. But I think it makes sense now. Most things in life are like that. Hinata smiles. Hanabi looks behind her sister toward the door. His father. He said he'd come congratulate you when he knows who you'll face in the finals. Hinata answers the unasked question. But he said it in, like, a deeper voice. Naruto tries to lighten the mood. I'm sure he did. Hanabi chuckles. Say, is... Is Konohimaru awake yet? Dunno. Naruto shrugs. I sent a clone to check up on him. I'll go there myself in a bit. Hinata cocks her head. Concerned? Even thought you were so overly aggressive in the arena. I don't think I've seen you like that. That's... Well, Hanabi grumbles. He's just so irritating. I couldn't help myself. But he showed he's competent as a shinobi, at least. 
She looks away. Sakura smirks and shares a look with Hinata. Right, of course. She stands up and walks back to where Naruto is. I'll go check up on Konohimaru and then come back to start your treatment. Until then, keep your arm relaxed, alright? Don't move too much? Naruto looks deep in thought. Don't sprain a muscle. Sakura nudges him with an elbow. You think my chakra could help? Naruto asks, unfazed by the nudging. Sakura raises a brow. Your chakra? Why would? Oh. She recalls the strengthening effect his chakra had back during the fourth war. That would actually speed her recovery up exponentially. But I'd need you around often for the treatments. That's fine. I can be everywhere at once, remember? He grins in response. I can't ask you to do that. Hanabi jumps from her seat. The moment she does, she winces in pain from moving her hand too much. Natsu reaches over to aid her in sitting back down, taking special care with the hand. It's fine. Naruto reassures her. It's least I could do since we're gonna be family, you know? Hinata blushes at the declaration, earning a chuckle from Hanabi. Thank you Naruto. Hinata smiles. Sakura pats him on the back. Look at you, being so forward. Come on, let's see how your protege is doing. A couple of rooms over, Konohimaru stirs away in his bed. When he opens his eyes he's met by an unfamiliar white ceiling, but when he turns his head, he's at least met by two familiar faces. Sakura and Naruto. Naruto is leaning against the wall while Sakura goes over the results given to her by the medics who took care of him before. He tries to move but grunts in pain, now noticing his bandaged body. Sakura whips her head around and immediately places a hand on his chest, stopping him from getting up. Don't. Ugh, I lost, didn't I? The boy leans back on his pillow. You did. Naruto nods. But you for it damn good. Konohimaru sighs. Not good enough. It's early to tell. Sakura walks over to begin examining his wounds. Remember, the point of the Chunin exams isn't to win, it's to showcase your abilities. Is losing an ability? He continues to sulk. Naruto rubs the back of his head. Hey, come on, since when are you the kinda guy to get down like this? She's the one person I didn't want to lose to. Now she'll be even more insufferable. He whines. Sakura chuckles. Maybe not as much as you expect. You don't know her, sis. She might act all noble and kind, but she's not acting all high and mighty. He mumbles. Maybe you just bring out that side of her. Sakura looks back to Naruto. Something you two have in common. She then stands up and pats the boy on the arm. You'll be fine after you rest. And hey. You actually managed to use the Rasengan one-handed. That's awesome. Naruto grins. That the surprise you were so eager to show off? You never told me you managed to do it. Konohimaru gives a nervous laugh. Yeah. I've been training real hard on it, but it wasn't the trump card I was hoping. Maybe not now. But in the future? It's gonna kick a lot of ass. You know we now gotta train with the Rasengan even more, right? Naruto grins. His young friend returns the grin. Definitely. You gonna be fine for now? Naruto asks. Konohimaru gives a thumbs up. Don't worry about me, boss. I'm made of tough stuff. I'll be with you soon. Once Sakura makes sure he's recovering well, she and Naruto leave Konohimaru along with his thoughts. Once the door shuts, Konohimaru's smile drops and he focuses intently on his right hand, gathering only a small amount of swirling chakra before releasing it. Shinobi Union. Chunin Exams Semi-Final. Yumai of the Hidden Cloud vs. Shero Aramaki of the Hidden Stone, with Hanabi Hayuga already decided as the first finalist, it's time to announce the second Genin who will fight to the end. Yumai stands tall, assured in her abilities. She's wearing plain dark clothes, contrasted by traditional white cloud arm and leg warmers. In front of her is a smaller girl with short green, just barely going below her, a green hair hoop, and her headband around her neck. By her side is a frill neck lizard that reaches her waist, that hisses at Yumai. As before, Genma Shiranyui mediates the match, laying the ground rules and signaling the start of the fight. The two Genin fight well and they fight evenly enough. Yumai has to fend off two opponents at once, but she does well with her lightning style. The lizard proves very swift and slippery, but so does Yumai. Shero switches regularly between Taijutsu and Earth style, which she uses mainly for defense and creating obstacles, which are no match for the lightning style, but they create enough of a diversion to be annoying. Both Shero and her lizard are skilled at jumping through and around debris, which makes them formidable, even when the earth ninjutsu falls. Ultimately, however, the lightning catches up with them. Yumai tricks her opponent into thinking she's going to use a powerful lightning ninjutsu on the lizard, prompting Shero to protect it. 
the cloud genin takes advantage of the momentary distraction and shifts her focus to a smaller scale ninjutsu, changing the target from the lizard to Shero herself. The stone genin falls, leaving the lizard on its own with little defense or support. It's felled soon after, leaving. Yumai of the hidden cloud wins. Genma flickers down to announce the victor. Two medical teams immediately rush out to tend to take Shero Aramaki and her lizard to the infirmary. Sakura Haruno, as head of the medical unit, and Hana Inuzuka, as chief veterinarian, await for their patients to arrive. Between the semi-finals and the finals, there's a two-day period for rest and recuperation, giving the last two contestants enough time to regain their energy from the previous bouts. During this time, Hanabi focuses entirely on healing her arm, with the full support of Sakura's healing and Naruto's chakra. The shinobi union has shown each other what they have to offer in terms of young talent, and the leaders are progressing in their negotiations. The way things are going, this might just be a success. End of chapter 48 Trivia Aramaki Shero is from the Chknin exam on fire. Naruto vs. Konohimaru. OVA. There, her first name is Aramaki, and her last name is Shero. I flipped it around on purpose because I prefer that name for a clan that fights alongside Frill Neck Lizard. Author's Notes In true Naruto fashion, I added a flashback in the middle of combat, keeping it real. Chapter 49 Academy Days Part 7 Shinobi Union Chapter 4 Hidden Leaf Hospital Now in a proper hospital, Sakura is better equipped to heal Hanabi's injured hand. Not that the infirmary is poorly equipped, but it's definitely designed more for first aid. Besides the facility, she has an assistant, too. A meno, jonin from the hidden sand and practitioner of a very unique form of medical ninjutsu. A meno has conjured her medical water style. Jellyfish and had it latch on Hanabi's shoulder. It pulsates and pumps water down her arm and to her hand. This is... weird. Hanabi eyes the jellyfish. A meno chuckles. I imagine it's your first time encountering it, Hanabi nods in response. Sakura, using her mystical palm, gathers the water that drips down and integrates into her own jutsu. It's a powerful form of medical ninjutsu. It'll be really helpful on top of everything. I'm glad you came, Ameno. How could I not? You don't always get the chance to work closely in the medical system Lady Tsunade established. Ameno smiles. So you're a big fan of hers, too? Hanabi asks. Of course. The meno answers with glee. Even though we've been enemies, Lady Tsunade is who people looked up to while studying as medics, in the same way puppet users looked up to Lady Chiyo. That name means nothing to Hanabi, but she decides against asking, instead focusing on her own recovery. It just goes to show how much she revolutionized the practice. Sakura stops using her mystical palm and turns to the figure staying back. All right, you're up. Naruto is leaning against a wall with his arms crossed and an annoyed expression on his face. He opens his eyes to reveal a blood-red hue instead of the usual blue. Kurama walks over and sits next to Hanabi. Hundreds of years of living, of dominating the world, or instilling terror into whatever hapless fool crosses my path. And now I'm to play nurse for a reckless brat? He whines. I think I'd rather be back in the Gido Mezo. Yes, yes. Sakura sighs. You've made your feelings very clear. Honestly I didn't know tailed beasts were like. This, Ameno motions to Kurama. Kurama scoffs. There's so much you don't know, child. How many nations existed before your precious lands of wind or fire, how many times shinobi villages were founded and crumbled before yours. You can't comprehend how much you don't know. Hanabi stares in disbelief, being taken aback at that voice coming out of Naruto's face. Sakura shakes her head. How does Naruto put up with you? Kurama turns his head away and places a hand on Hanabi's shoulder, transferring his chakra to her. The girl's robe takes on an orange glow with the usual black markings crossing through it. Her breath stops for a second when the surge of power washes over her, a feeling unlike anything she's ever felt before. With this amount of power, I probably could have fought all the other 32 genin at once. And Naruto lives with this power all day? She admires the strength. In her mind, she hears a deep chuckle. This much is nothing compared to the power Naruto and I wield. Hanabi finds herself in an unfamiliar headspace, a light white surrounds her in every direction. She looks down and definitely feels like she's stepping on something, even when it doesn't look like there's a floor. The voice comes from behind her this time. Don't spend too much time being surprised. I'd rather we get this over with soon. She turns around only to be met by the giant figure of the demon fox, all nine tails swishing back and forth behind. 
she stares in awe at the massive overbearing form. Hidden Leaf Training Grounds Yakimaru watches in confusion as Katori rides an ostrich, running at full speed in circles. She has her arms outstretched and she's taking in the wind blowing in her face. I still don't know how that'll help. He wonders. It's to feel the wind in my hair. Katori shouts in answer. Will that help? He turns to Mutsu sitting next to him. Mutsu shrugs. Maybe? It's not how I learned but my jutsu's different. I'm telling you, it's foolproof. Katori reassures them. I'll be flying in no time. That spirit, Katori. Kashiwama cheers. If anyone can figure it out, you can. As he focuses on Katori for a moment, a fist comes flying at him. He manages to see it in time and dodges, turning his attention back to his opponent. Shoto takes his stance. Not the time to be distracted. The Senju smirks. I can multitask. Over to the side, Genzai and Jiriki are similarly locked in combat, the young Saratobi using a flurry of punches and kicks that even Jiriki has a hard time keeping up with. I'm surprised you came with us. Genzai notes. I thought you didn't like them. I don't. Jiriki answers. But you insist on hanging with them for some reason. Genzai chuckles. Jealous? Jiriki delivers a harder hit in annoyance. As if, you're just the only one who can put up a fight against me. Is that what you call this? Genzai pushes Jiriki's arms away and shoulder barges him. A swift leg sweep knocks the Hyuga to the ground. Genzai offers him a hand. If I treated you the way you treat others, we wouldn't be friends, you know that, right? Jiriki clicks his tongue and stands up on his own. So you see nothing wrong with that? He motions to Katori riding an ostrich. Fruitless and pointless so-called training? Of course not. Genzai shrugs. It's fun. Guys, Katori calls out to everyone. Let's go eat. I'm getting hungry. Giving up on training? Shoto asks as he and Kashiwama exchange blows. Of course not. She says in defiance, offended at the mere thought of giving up. I just figure we should take a. Her stomach growls, break. She becomes flustered. Shoto laughs. Okay, sure. He lowers his guard. Unable to stop his fist in time, Kashiwama punches Shoto on the nose. Duh. Sorry, what the hell, man. Shoto holds his sore face. Raymond Ichiraku. The food of choice is, of course, Raymond at Ichiraku. It's surprisingly filled to the brim, with every table being occupied, most of them by foreign shinobi of all villages. It seems that word of this restaurant has spread. Tiuchi gladly welcomes the kids. Welcome, welcome, take a seat. He motions to the stools at the bar. Sorry, Yakimaru, your mom's not on shift today. That's fine, we're just stopping for a bite. He sits down with the rest. Katori looks around at the full establishment. You don't need the help? Ayama, Matsu, and Nishi got it handled, don't you worry. So, what can I get you all? The kids place their orders and dig in. At some point Ayama comes out to switch with her dad and catches up with what the kids are up to while she serves other customers. They're all eager to share in their studies and in their training, except for maybe Jiriki who's content with just eating his ramen. As Katori explains how she's definitely going to learn to fly, a familiar to her voice chimes in. You think you've reached that point, huh? She turns around on her stool to see Samui standing behind her. Samui? Katori exclaims and hugs her. Samui remains frozen at the display of affection. She's still not the best with kids. Hello to you, too. She gives Katori an awkward pat on the back. You seem well. Genzai looks over the cloud Kanoichi over. Aren't you the leader of the hidden cloud Genin's leader? Very observant. She nods. I am, indeed. You're all Katori's friends, I take it? We are. They all introduce themselves in turn. How do you know each other? Shoto asks. Oh. We stayed in Samui's home when we were visiting the cloud. She really helped me train and taught me a lot. Katori answers. And now you're like an actual teacher, huh? Just like you said. I don't speak lightly, you know. If I say I'll do something, I do it. Your team looked really strong. Yakimaru notes. But not strong enough to defeat Lady Hanabi. Jiriki eats his ramen. I suppose that's to be seen. You're a Hayuga, huh? Hanada's cousin? Samui asks. And Lady Hanabi's. Fifth cousin, thrice removed. Jiriki clarifies. I see. Katori raises brow. You know the whole family tree? Of course I do. He says, still focused on his ramen. We've a proud history and tradition. Genzai finishes the sentence for him. Jiriki glares at him. Well, either way I look forward to seeing how your lady Hanabi will fare. You'll cheer me on, right, Katori? Samui looks at the girl. Aya. She frantically looks around, not knowing how to answer. 
On one hand, Samui was of great help when they lived with her, but Hanabi is also her mom's sister. Seeing Katori's distress, Samui gives a light smile. I was only joking. You don't need to worry so much over it. We'll see each other again, Katori. I'm curious how you've grown. She turns to take her leave. Definitely. Katori gives a determined nod. Shinobi Union Meeting Hall Over the course of the four days of the Chunin exams, the village leaders kept their regular meetings, ironing out the details of the future of the Shinobi world. There was some friction, mainly among the hidden star and hidden grass. Some were apprehensive toward the hidden mountain and especially how big their land had gotten. After all, it's not every day that three whole nations become one. Still, that's more to do with the land of woods, and not particularly the hidden mountain village itself, even though they've benefited greatly, as would be expected. Kaitamaru taps the table with a finger. You realize this is a tall order. Arachimaru's research became ours the moment the land of rice paddies was absorbed into the land of woods. It's ours by every legal right. A nods. And what research there is that doesn't pertain to any other village is to remain yours. Anoki leans on the table. We simply ask that any sensitive information about other villages be returned to said villages. You could argue that that's everything. Arachimaru once was a member of the Hidden Leaf. Should studies on his unique physiology be sent to the Hidden Leaf? Kaitamaru asks. No. Sonata clarifies. Only what immediately would affect the security of a hidden village or its secrets. That's still such a broad definition. Kaitamaru sighs. But also left to your own interpretation, isn't it? Conan looks to her fellow leader. You can send whatever information you deem fits the criteria. And conversely, if something would later come to light that you all believe met the criteria but I didn't, that becomes an issue. Kaitamaru says. If something like that happens, Sonata speaks, we can negotiate once more and come to an understanding. You do have the winning hand here, since we don't know exactly what intel Arachimaru had gathered. We can't be precise with your treaty because we don't know the extent of what you've gathered, and you wouldn't allow us access until a treaty is signed so you can see the bind we're in. Perhaps you're right. It's the time of goodwill, is it not? Kaitamaru gives an unreadable smile. He signs his name on the bottom and pushes the folder forward. The Hidden Mountain Village agrees to the Shinobi Union's demands. Gara nods. Thank you for your understanding. Conan signs her name and pushes her folder forward. The Hidden Rain Village agrees to the Shinobi Union's demands. The Rare does the same. Likewise, the Hidden Frost Village agrees to the demands. Shibuki follows. The Hidden Waterfall Village, as well. Nakago sighs. He takes the pen and holds it over the documents for a moment. With some protest from our own, the Hidden Star Village accepts the demands. He signs his name and pushes the folder forward. Only Taiga remains in her seat, one leg over the other, staring at the folder. Taiga, mate rise to grab her attention. You talk a whole lot about the demands of the Union. What about mine? She looks up to Tsunade. The Hakage narrows her eyes. And what would that be? You know damn well what, Karen Yuzumaki. And you know equally well that the answer was, is, and will be no. Taiga clicks her tongue. What's your obsession with a dead clan? Think we ain't done our homework? We know the Yuzumaki you got are barely shinobi. Genin and Chunin. A small handful of Jonin. Let them be what they're good at. Chakra batteries. Kaitamaru, you've been warned to be mindful of your speech, Taiga Hazama. Sonata balls up her fist. Hakage. A whispers, trying to remind her not to do something she'll later regret. The Yuzumaki ain't a clan no more. They're weak, but they can actually be useful if you know how to use them. Kaitamaru breathes in deeply. Hazama. Sonata growls. They're tools, Hakage. Nothing more, nothing less. Taiga sneers. Sonata had heard enough. She stands up, not actually knowing what she'll say or do just yet, but knowing she needs to be shut up. Before she can, however, someone else takes action. From one seat over, Kaitamaru summons his giant axe and brings it down on Taiga in an instant. The seat is completely destroyed, but Taiga managed to get out the way just in time. The entourage gathered immediately spring into action. The grass jonin ready their weapons, as do the mountain shinobi. Mizushi has a large tortoise shell planted in front of him, Kuga and Setsuin have their claws out, Takeshi has his tanto at the ready. The two groups stare each other down. Every other shinobi also moved to defend their leaders. The rare Kano, who was sitting between Kaitamaru and Taiga, flickered back to safety. A slams his fist on the table. What's the meaning of this? Taiga smirks. Kaitamaru Sakata. What a surprise. Was it something I said? Your voice is grating. Kaitamaru glares at her while pulling his axe out of the ground and slinging it over his shoulder. 
A woman made of sand stands between the grass and mountain shinobi, blocking them off from each other. Whatever happens, this cannot escalate further. Gara states. Taiga, Kaitameru, please stand down. May requests. We gathered here specifically to prevent this kind of thing from happening again. Me stand down? Taiga snorts. I ain't tried to cleave someone in half. But I get the message loud and clear. This union ain't gonna work out. And what do you intend to do, Taiga? Anoki asks. Continue to operate on your own? It's how we always done it so far. Worked out fine, didn't it? Taiga shrugs and turns to leave. And when this little party of yours comes crumbling down, we'll be there to pick up the pieces. Taiga, wait. Mate pleads. Think this through. The union is not gonna last. Taiga cuts her off. You lot have fun now. With that, Taiga and the grass shinobi take their leave. Anoki growls. Sakata, explain yourself. You heard her, Tsuchikage. Kaitameru places his axe back in its containment scroll. She never believed in the union to begin with. She was here just to get back Karen Yuzumaki. And you thought to attack her on the spot. Kaitameru looks at the ruined chair. Apparently I did. Sonata sits down with her head in her palms. Honestly, I might have done the same. Either way, it's done. And he's right, she made her intentions clear. It's likely she had no intention of joining the union to begin with. A true shame. May shakes her head. I hope she doesn't come to regret her decision. The rare only now sits back on his chair, with the commotion having died down. It was certainly a brash course of action, but not one made lightly. Is it, Lord Sakata? Kaitameru looks at the Frost Leader without saying a word. Shibuki sighs. Perhaps an added point is to not attack fellow members of the Union and choose discourse before violence. But she was not a member of the Union, was she? Conan says. So even if such a point was added, it wasn't broken in this case. Nakago rubs the back of his head. For what it's worth, I'm somewhat relieved. I was beginning to worry about the Union if someone with her attitude was part of it. Still, A sits in his chair, we've made good progress, the Shinobi Union has doubled in size. Now, we can focus on truly growing and changing the shinobi world. Can hardly wait. Kaitameru remarks with a smirk. Later. What was that? Kuga demands. Was that freak out some master plan? Cause a warning would have been nice. She hounds Kaitameru outside of the meeting hall once the final meeting ends. It was. An impulse decision. Kaitameru grumbles. I'm inclined to agree that it felt a reckless course of action. Mizushi says. However, it is one I can understand. Takeshi cocks his head, still in his oni mask. I'm surprised. You've always been good at keeping a level head. You're not growing emotional, are you, Kaitameru? The mountain leader walks right into Takeshi's personal space, staring into his mask's eye holes. I've always been emotional, Takeshi. Emotion fuels everything I do and it's gotten us to a point where no one else could have gotten us, and it's never been a cause for complaint in the time we've known each other. If you've begun taking an issue now, then you're the one who's growing something. He pats the Anbu leader on the shoulder. I just don't know what. Is she a concern? Kuga asks. Who? Taiga. Kaitameru steps away from Takeshi. Not even remotely. The only thing the hidden grass can do now is lay low. They're surrounded by the union from all sides, and unless they have a secret tailed beast they're hiding, they can't afford to do anything. So what's next for us? Mizushi asks. Well, once we go home tomorrow, we have to return back sensitive information to their villages. Kaitameru shrugs. After that, we study, learn, and grow. We wait patiently. Shushuya. As one of the Hidden Leaf's top sake shops, Shushuya sees its fair bit of clientele. This evening, however, they closed early to accommodate their special guests. You really didn't need to. Naruto looks apologetically to the owner. I don't want you losing clients or anything. Nonsense, sir. The owner reassures. It's with our greatest pleasure that we offer you our best service. Please enjoy. He places another bottle of sake on the house and takes his leave. Naruto rubs the back of his sheet. Sorry about this. Didn't want to attract this much attention. Gara chuckles on the opposite side of the table. I don't believe you're capable of not attracting attention. And I am somewhat conspicuous, myself. B lifts his cup. If you ain't attracting attention, you ain't living right. Gotta go big, bro. Hinata takes the bottle and fills up both of their cups before filling her own. Contrary to his boasting, Naruto doesn't actually handle being famous well. She giggles. You don't have to tell them that. Naruto grumbles, then you've learned nothing. B slams his cup on the table. Looks like I gotta stick around some more, teach you to be bombastic as you oughta be. 
Naruto waves his hands defensively in front of himself. I don't think we need to go that far. Still, I'm pleased we could meet up. Gara sips his drink. These past days have been busy. Hey, you don't have to tell me. I'm not even part of the negotiations and I'm swamped with work. Is being a Kage also this tiring? Geez, Naruto sighs. Perhaps even more so. Gara nods. There's so much to pay heed to. It's the price for being a boss. You get recognition, but your free time takes a loss. B laughs. Why I don't get myself involved in that stuff. I like living free and playing rough. But you're Lord Raikage's brother, correct? Hinata asks. Aren't you expected to help him in leading the village? Nope. The hidden clouds B is the Jinchuriki. B keeps safe, protects, and defends. Those are all the same thing. Gara notes. B finishes his rhyme, and that's where our job starts and where it ends. For other stuff, that's where Darui and C come in. And lately Samui's been getting more involved. Aids are of great importance. Lady Hakage has Shizunet, Shikamaru, Kakashi-sensei. They're all an invaluable part of her team. Hinata adds. I agree. Kankuro in particular has been invaluable. I'd have wished Tamari be by my side, but she was adamant in being the union's representative here in the leaf. Tamari was the one who insisted? Hinata raises a brow. Why would she want that? Naruto asks. I mean, not that she shouldn't but still. Gara shrugs. She wouldn't divulge. Kankuro claims to know, but is yet to actually say anything. Hinata smiles a knowing smile. Not that she's one to gossip, but word does get around, especially if you spend any amount of time around Eno. Gossip about what, or who, led Tamari here. Say, Gara, have you had any luck with the great beasts, or that weird thing we fought in the land of wind? Naruto brings up the big topic on most shinobi's thoughts. Gara shakes his head. I'm afraid not. They've disappeared as if they never existed. I spoke with Shukaku to ask for his aid in the matter. He agreed, but not out of love for the hidden villages. Matatabi's gonna look around, too, while me and Biyuki do our thing. And what thing is that? Naruto asks. Ah, you know. B clears his throat. Eight tails things. He hides himself behind his cup. But never mind that, how's the clan life? He tries to change the topic. It's clear to Gara and Hinata that B apparently intends on taking it easy. The four of them talk well into the evening, using their last evening here to catch up. They finally got some semblance of free time, enough to speak to friends in a casual setting. Or as casual as a setting can be, given that the entire place was empty just for them. Still, it's nice to be among friends. Hakage Tower Sonata walks down the corridor, tired and stretching her arms with a yawn. She wasn't expecting to get this worked up. As she's thinking of the sweet, sweet sake awaiting her, a voice calls out to her. Hakage, wait. May catches up to her. If you're free tonight, why not come with us to let off some steam? Does who? Sonata stops to talk. May looks back, and Sonata follows her gaze to Conan who's standing a bit back. It's been a heavy few days. Us ladies deserve some time to relax, away from the boorish men. Sonata chuckles. Maybe you're right, but I'm pretty boorish myself. I don't think I'd make good company. Conan steps forward. If this is about my presence, I'd like to try and make amends. If nothing else, I owe at least that much to Naruto. All right, fine. Sonata sighs. Come on, if it's relaxation you want, I know all the good onsen that serve sake. She beckons them to follow her. The two other women share a look. Just the ones that serve sake? A very brief walk later, the three women find themselves at the Leaf Hot Springs, one of the larger onsen in the village and among Sonata's favorite. It's also the spiritual successor to the onsen where she most often found Jureya peeping in their younger days. And in their older days, truth be told, they quickly get themselves comfortable in the hot waters with special plates for sake that float in the water delivered to them, with the sake itself, of course. Sonata leans against the edge of the onsen. I think I really needed this. May chuckles. I told you. We need to loosen up after everything that happened. Conan looks around, feeling a bit out of place. I'm still not sure why you'd want to invite me along. Because we need to stick together. May smiles. Us Kanoichi have to fight especially hard to rise to the top, and even harder to remain there. If we don't support each other, who will? It was just during my grandfather's time that most women were expected to stay out of the dangers of the battlefield so they could keep strengthening their clans with more children. We've come a long way since then. Sonata explains. But certainly not all women, right? Conan asks. Of course not, but many still were. May shrugs. So we should celebrate how far we've managed to come. Conan shakes her head. I don't know how much I should be celebrated. 
Since I was young, I just followed Yuhiko's dreams, and when he died, I followed Nagato on his quest for vengeance. She leans her head back on the stones. And then I couldn't even stop Madara, or I guess Ibido, and fell into a coma. I certainly don't feel empowered. Come on, is this the attitude you attack the leaf with? Now I'm even angrier we lost. Sonata shakes her head. Conan slides further into the water in embarrassment. It doesn't matter how it was until now. What matters is that you've now put yourself in a position where you can be your own person and do things how you want to do them. It's not about when it happens, but what you do with it when it does. Mary assures Conan. You're going to great lengths to lift the spirits of a former criminal. Conan notes. May shrugs. Like I said, we should rely on each other. Besides, none of us are wholly innocent. I didn't get to my position without doing many heinous things, some to my own countrymen and fellow shinobi. It's a bloody world. The faster we move away from past feuds, the better. I certainly hope we can. Conan smiles. Well, Sonata shakes her cup, that's not going to happen if you don't drink. Our hot springs might not be as good as the land of water or land of hot springs, but our sake is some of the best. May chuckles and drinks from her own cup. I'm inclined to agree. Conan does, as well. We have a few indoor hot springs in the hidden rain, but much of it is powered by our machines. A natural hot spring like this is definitely something else. The three spend much of the evening in pleasant conversation. Small talk, mostly. Building friendship and opening up more. It's honestly more fun than any of them has been able to have in a long while, so it's a more than welcome breath of fresh air. Even a moment's respite from the worries of managing a shinobi village can do wonders for the soul. Eventually, Sonata's drinks get to her, and she has to head home before she consumes too much to function the following day. May and Conan, meanwhile, are still able to go through the night and do just that. Deciding that too much more steam would be bad for their health, they instead continue their drinks in the Mizukage's quarters. Conan gives a light laugh. And now I'm surrounded by Mist Shinobi everyone. I suppose this Saka really is good if I put myself at such odds. You still don't trust? May sits on her bed and leans against the board. You don't need to worry, I wouldn't do that in my room, even if that room is temporary. Someone else's room, maybe, but not mine. My love life is in enough disarray that I don't need to add bloodshed to it. Not had any luck in that department? Conan asks. I would have thought a woman in your position would be swarmed with suitors. May laughs. If only. No, I'm afraid no man stays around long enough for anything meaningful. I'll have to wait a long time to see myself in a wedding dress. She sighs and looks at a reflection in the body mirror in the corner. That's a shame. I think you'd look amazing in it. She lifts her hand, sending out a multitude of small paper towards May. The Mizukage raises a brow, but sees there's nothing malicious about her action or in the movements of the papers. The small pieces come together around May's entire body. The first layer forms into a straight dress, while the other papers twist and bend to create further decorations. Laces are formed on the bottom half of the dress, flowers decorate her chest and waist. In the end, May is dressed in a beautiful white gown. You don't need to wait. Conan smiles. May stands up from the edge of her bed and walks closer to the mirror, never taking her eyes off it. It's more beautiful than I've imagined. You have some gift. It can't all be used for killing, after all. And with this, you don't need to wait for any man to see how beautiful you'll look. May runs her hands down the dress, admiring every fine little detail. Some papers are so paper thing, they're see-through. You'd really think this is an actual gown. What about for yourself? Never thought of yourself in one? Conan shakes her head. With everything that happened, weddings were never part of my schedule. She stands up and her papers swirl around her, her cloak changing from dark blue to white, more and more details being added on top of it. With a gown of her own, she stands shoulder to shoulder with May. I doubt I'll find someone to wear this for, anyway. She dispels the papers and goes back to take a seat. May admires the dress before it too is dispelled. Well, maybe it's just that no one deserves us. I suppose that's one way to look at it. Conan chuckles. Right now the only thing I want is to properly lead the hidden rain as it should be, and finally be a mother to my son. I don't care about much of anything else at the moment. May takes her glass and raises it. Some things simply must take priority. I saw him around, he seems to be a good kid. Conan takes hers and clinks them. He is. She smiles. Speaking of, I should perhaps go. It's gotten late, Matsu will wonder where I am. The child being worried for the parent, it's a new feeling for me, as well. Conan stands, needing a moment to get her balance and let the alcohol settle in. Thank, Lady Mizukage, for not being wary of my company. May's calmer and pleasant demeanor shifts to a more saddened one. 
Her gaze shifts to the wall where she stares at nothing in particular, but her eyes show she's deep in thought, remembering something she'd probably prefer not to. I've seen enough in my life to know when people are sincere and want to change. You just seem like that. She blinks and looks up with a smile, trying to hide away the pain behind her words. Conan knows better than to prod. Thank you. She bows and goes to open the window. May raises a quizzical brow. Out the window? It's faster. Conan hops out accompanied by strings of papers that form out of her robe. They surround her and keep her in place in the air as she turns around to say her goodbyes. Until tomorrow, then. I do believe it's technically today. May chuckles. With that, Conan flies back to her own temporary accommodation, while May looks at the empty bottles the two had drunk. I should clean this or they might think I did this by myself. She mutters to herself. The next day. Hakage Monument. Kaitamaru sits atop the Hakage Monument overlooking the village, a symbol meant to remind the people that they're always protected, or maybe a symbol of arrogance. For him, it's the latter, but some would probably argue otherwise. Still, the view is undoubtedly remarkable and oddly calming. Maybe Hashirama Senju saw something to this monument concept that he doesn't. His moment of quiet comes to an end when someone comes looking for him all the way up here. Yo, Naruto gives a mock salute. Didn't think I'd find an outsider here. Naruto Uzumaki. To what do I owe the pleasure? Kaitamaru stands up to greet him. I heard what happened at the union meeting. About what the grass leader said and how you reacted. I don't suppose you're here to say it was an unacceptable emotional outburst? Kaitamaru shakes his head. The opposite, actually. You stood up for my family. Even if it probably damaged the union's growth, I don't think her words could just be ignored. So, thanks. Naruto offers him a handshake, which he accepts. Thanks isn't needed. I just couldn't stand to hear someone talk about a group of people like that. It's not right. I don't really know much about what the Uzumaki clan's been through, but I know people like Taiga Hazama made their lives difficult, even impossible. If she didn't see how it's a problem, then. I dunno if she called a state in the union. I'm of the same opinion. After all, how could anyone not find all life worth protecting? Kaitamaru gives the most genuine fake smile he can muster. I'm glad we agree. Naruto returns the smile. I hope we can work together, now that we're allies. I hope so, too. I've heard the stories about you, but I'm curious to get to know the real hero. Naruto rubs his head in embarrassment. Ah, people like to exaggerate a lot. Not like I was ever fighting alone. Every last person who fought is a hero. He looks out toward the village. Kaitamaru looks at him for a moment before bursting into laughter. No, the stories are definitely true. I can see that now. The Fuma clan also has nothing but praise for you, and their words come from long before the war. Sasama was overjoyed when I picked her to be our representative here in the leaf. Thank you for choosing her for that. Naruto nods. Kaitamaru shrugs. She was the obvious choice. If we want to build positive relations, we need people eager to do that. With her connection to you, she has the drive to make the Shinobi Union a success. Yeah, I'm really surprised how well it's worked so far. The five founding villages and now the five new members. Everyone's giving their all for the future. I gotta do my part, too. It's not just up to the union reps to do this. I fully agree. Kaitamaru nods. I don't want to take up any more of your time. Naruto pats Kaitamaru on the back. The Chunin exam finals are starting in a bit. Gotta go check up on everyone. Of course. It's a busy time, after all. Kaitamaru watches as Naruto flickers down the Hakage Monument and towards the village, taking to the rooftops to get to where he needs to go. Kaitamaru grips the stone underneath him. You're a good man, Naruto, but you're not an Uzumaki. You never lived among us, you never knew us, you never knew the kind of loss we experienced. We weren't just treated harshly, we were slaves. We experienced cruelty that went beyond skirmishes or war casualties. The kind that can be fixed with a simple apology or an alliance. He walks to the edge of the monument and looks down. Your heart's in the right place, but heart alone won't make this right. He lets himself fall off the edge. He closes his eyes as the wind hits his face. Close to the ground, he flickers to safety on the ground. It'll be a real shame when I have to kill you, cousin. Kaitamaru looks to the rooftops in the distance from where Sasuke is watching like a hawk. Hidden Leaf Arena Hanabi breathes in and out, in and out. Calm, measured breaths. Meditative. How are you feeling, Hanabi? Hinata asks. Much better. She looks at her right palm. It's still a shade of blue, but nowhere near what it was before. I can put up a fight, thanks to you all. She turns to her medics. 
Sakura, Ameno, and even Kurama once again inhabiting one of Naruto's shadow clones. I simply hope it's enough. Ameno worries. It'll have to be. Sakura sighs. It's the best job we could do. Normally you'd need several weeks of rest, but thankfully we had a method of speeding up the healing process. Yo! Naruto calls out, running down the corridor, enthusiastically waving at them. I made it. You ready, Hanabi? All healed up? I am. She pumps her fist. I won't let the hidden leaf down. Pum. Karama blows air out his nose. Of course she's all healed. Who do you think was responsible for that? I was. Sakura raises her hand. I, as well. Ameno raises her hand. And it's only because of my chakra that your mediocre healing did anything. Karama boasts. Sakura turns to Naruto. How do you put up with him? Hinata giggles. Well, thank all of you for doing what you did. I'm sure you'd have preferred to have more free time than you did. Oh, not at all. Ameno reassures her. I got to work closely with Sakura and see firsthand Lady Tsunade's innovations in medical ninjutsu. It's everything I could have hoped for. She gives a bright smile. Naruto chuckles. You did say you wanted to work with Sakura before. The siren sounds from the arena. The Chunin exam finals are about to commence. Hanabi takes one final deep breath and begins walking to the exit. It's time. We'll be rooting for you. Hanada calls out. You'd better. Hanabi turns to her with a grin. Walking along, she tries to clear her mind of distraction. She focuses on the fight ahead, on her opponent. When not being healed, Hiashi helped in her recovery and in her training, namely how to not entirely rely on her dominant right hand and to keep fighting even without relying on it. He ran her through all the strategies her opponent had used up to the semi-finals and how she's most likely to fight today. Focus on all of that. No other distraction. Speaking of, Konohamaru's leaning against a wall just before the arena exit. A part of her wants to just pretend he's not here, but that strategy only makes him more annoying. She stops next to him and sighs, waiting for him to say whatever nonsense he will so she can go about her way. Konohamaru looks to her bruised hand and back to her. His face is serious, his usual goofy expression nowhere in sight. He holds up his hand, palm facing toward her. Win, Hanabi turns to him with a raised brow. Not what she expected of him. She high fives him and continues walking. Naturally. Shinobi Union Chunin Exams Finals. Hanabi Hayuga of the Hidden Leaf vs. Yumai of the Hidden Cloud. Lightning style. Electric field. Yumai plants a metal rod into the ground, sending her chakra through it to make a field of electricity that would shock anyone who steps into or even near it. Hanabi has no intention of getting struck by any of that. Gentle fist. Vacuum palm, she sends a gust of chakra at Yumai, hoping to force her to move out of the field she'd created. Yumai does but very quickly hops back in. The cloud genin takes out six shuriken, three in each hand, and charges them with her chakra nature. Her own chakra empowered by the electric field around her make them spark far more intensely than normal, lightning style. Shuriken storm, she throws the lightning-infused shuriken fly at her from multiple directions. She's well aware that even a close call could jolt her, so giving them a wide berth is best in this situation. Normally she could use her one-blow jutsu, but that would require them to reach her. Instead, a simple dodge, allowing them to just fly over and around her. As she does, Yumai begins weaving her chakra again. If she thinks she can catch me off guard, she's sorely mistaken. Hanabi prepares her vacuum palm to push back whatever lightning is to come after her this time. Lightning style, lightning net, the electricity on the shuriken begins flying off of them. Each shuriken has what looks like a small lightning bolt jut out and connect to the nearest shuriken by its own bolt. The six shuriken form a web of lightning that Hanabi does not see coming. The lightning strikes her and she screams in pain. The shuriken wrap around her with their lightning, striking her more and more. Her muscles spasm and she falls to one knee. Unable to keep herself standing, she falls down. The shuriken return to normal. She never used that in the other fight. Damn it. Damn it. Hanabi tries to fight against her own body, but it's refusing to listen to any command. I can barely mold my chakra. This is bad. Yumai sees her chance and approaches the fallen Hayuga. Even her fists become surrounded in sparking chakra, ready to finish the fight. Genma stands on the side, trying to gauge the situation. This definitely looks like a decided match. There's not much of a chance to turn this around for Hanabi Hayuga, but he's been wrong before. He stays back until the very last second. The Cloud Genin stands above Hanabi and brings down her fist to deliver a powerful blow to knock her out. Hanabi, despite her body not listening, musters something out of her chakra. A jutsu for which you don't need your body. 
In fact, it's a jutsu designed specifically for situations when you can't. One blow body, she emits a powerful blast of chakra from every single chakra point in her body. The force takes Yumai by surprise and knocks her back and dazes her for a second. Yumai braces herself and goes in for another strike, this time with more force, knowing that Hanabi can still fight back in this situation. That wasn't enough. I need more time. A more powerful blow. More chakra. She grits her teeth and molds her chakra one more time. One blow burst, where the one blow body sends out chakra in the user's immediate vicinity, this one has a much, much increased radius and force. The jutsu digs into the ground, creating a crater centered around Hanabi. Everything around her, even larger rocks and Yumai herself, are blown away with an intense force. Yumai falls against a rock, opening a wound on the back of her head. On the village leader's stand, Conan watches on in surprise. That jutsu? It's almost like Nagato's almighty push. On the other side of the arena, Naruto has the exact same thought. She can even do something like that. Hanabi regains control of her body and stands up. She's still dazed from the jutsu she was exposed to, but she can't afford to let that slow her down. While Yumai herself is still dazed from her chakra system from being jostled, Hanabi comes in close. Using her gentle fist, the Hayuga tries to stop her from weaving any more chakra, but the Cloud Kanoichi isn't about to back off. With neither in best shape, one still reeling from the effects of the electricity and the other from the pushback, they engage in one last desperate attempt to knock the other out. Hanabi manages to get a few good hits in and close off some chakra points, but it's not enough to actually disrupt the chakra flow, as Yumai still has lightning covering her fists which numbers her own arms. Yumai relies mainly on punching, delivering jabs and hooks that either miss or come close to hitting. Either way, her jutsu allows her an extended reach of sorts. Hanabi's gente fist as always is more fluid, relying on light jabs. After an intense bout, neither giving in and relying on their ability's passive effect to take over their foe, Yumai lands a deciding punch to Hanabi's jaw. The Hayuga is stunned for a moment, allowing Yumai to deliver another punch to the gut and to the side. When Hanabi loses her balance and bends over, one final hit to the head knocks her out cold. Genma flickers to them when Hanabi falls. He checks her vitals and for signs of awareness, but finds none. The winner of the Shinobi Union's first joint union exams. Yumai of the Hidden Cloud. The crowd cheers, while some of the Leaf citizens and Shinobi show visible disappointment that the one they were rooting for lost. Hidden Leaf Streets while everyone is at the arena to watch the final fight, Karen and Jugo take this opportunity to do some shopping. Karen's tried to stay as far away from foreign shinobi as possible, but if they're all in the arena, then she has some time to move about as she wishes. Of course, the Anbu station to protect her are still around. If she focuses on her sensory abilities, she can feel where they are, but she still has to focus more than usual to pinpoint them. If she didn't know where they are, she'd have difficulty tracking them. They're pretty good at what they do. Not that she needed a reminder. She spent a good year as a prisoner in the Hidden Leaf and always had Anbu around her back then. Where they used to keep an eye on her, now they protect her. How times have changed. As she and Jugo go around to buy food, Jugo keeps particularly close to her. The two practically look glued together. Well, well, well. A very familiar voice causes Karen to freeze in place. A voice she has absolutely no fond memories of. Ain't you going on without a care in the world? Karen slowly turns her head to see Taiga Hazama standing with some of her grass shinobi behind her. Taiga. Why? Why are you here? Jugo stands in front of her. You've been avoiding me this whole time. After all we've been through. That's real rude Karen. Taiga steps closer to her. Don't come any closer. Karen demands. Or what? Taiga growls. Jugo activates his senjutsu, the entire right side of his body, taking on the gray monstrous appearance. She said stay back. Taiga claps so you found someone dumb enough to protect you. Congrats. Now be a good girl and come home. I already am. Karen states, the initial fear she experienced fading away, finding her strength. Go away, Hazama. You little. Apparently you didn't learn any manners. I'll have to beat it into you, then. An ethereal voice joins the conversation. You'll do nothing of the sort. A man appears in front of Taiga Hazama out of nowhere. This wasn't a body flicker or anything like that. He didn't step in front, he just materialized. Sasuke places himself on the scene before anything can escalate further. However, the moment he intervened, a few other figures also surrounded them. A team of Anbu. No weapons drawn, but definitely threatening. 
Sai places a hand on his tanto, only slightly removing it from its sheath. Taiga Hazama of the Hidden Grass Village. You're formally requested to leave the territory of the Hidden Leaf Village. We hope you've enjoyed your stay. So this is how it's gonna be, huh, Hakage? Taiga glares at Sai and Sasuke. Fine. But don't think this is over Karen. You're coming with me, one way or another. No, Karen remains firm. If you think you can scare me then you're sorely mistaken. Because I've learned just how much of a weak and powerless bully you actually are. You can't do anything to me. We'll see how long you can keep up that attitude, girl. Sai motions to his team to escort the grass shinobi out of the village. He himself remains to check up on Karen. Are you well? Yeah, I am. Karen nods. Thanks. Sasuke looks over Karen and Jugo before turning to walk away. Sasuke, wait. Karen calls out to him as she steps closer. She still hesitates for a moment but approaches him. Thanks, and? Sorry. Sasuke shakes his head. No, I should be saying that. I never apologized for everything. Not like I gave you a chance. Even Jugo didn't come to talk to you so he wouldn't upset me. Jugo walks up to them, placing a hand on Karen's shoulder. I thought it'd be for the best. You're a good man, Jugo. Sasuke says. Better than I ever was. From now on, it's important who we can be, not who we were. I believe that's a lesson we all learn from the same person. Jugo smiles. Sasuke chuckles lightly. I suppose it is. How about? We all meet up some day? Actually have a conversation? Karen offers. That'd be nice. But now it might be better you head home. Sasuke motions to the Anbu. Your guards look on edge. Sorry about this. Jugo apologizes to Sai and his team. It's quite all right. Sai reassures them. Jugo and Karen bid their farewells and go back to the Uzumaki district, while the Anbu return to the shadows. You were slow. Sasuke jokes at Sai's expense. You're simply too fast. Sai jokes back. I didn't actually think she'd be crazy enough to approach Karen Uzumaki. She knew she was being closely monitored. Goes to show some people don't know better. Sasuke shrugs. I'll leave you back to your work. The two men part ways, as well. Sasuke thinks about going to the arena to watch, but it's probably over by this point. The foreign villages are likely already preparing to go home. With the Chunin exams now officially over, it's also time for the new shinobi union to part ways and begin the process to facilitate a better future, where all shinobi work in unity. One by one, each village's groups take their leave after saying their farewells to people from the leaf they're on good terms with and with their village's representative. Gara and Kankuro hug their elder sister. Was good to see you again, Tamari. Kankuro squeezes her. Yeah, all right, now let go. She laughs while patting him on the back. We will try to stay in touch more often. Gara gives a light smile. Kankuro looks back to Shikamaru. And remember, she really likes Kenshin soup. Can't get enough of the stuff. A flustered Tamari smacks him over the head. You keep your big mouth shut. To the side, Ameno and Sakura say their farewells, too. I'm glad we got to work together. A shame it came to an end so soon. Ameno laments. We might be able to. Lady Tsunada wants us to send medics to all the Shinobi Union nations for training. I'll just get myself assigned to the sand. Sakura gives a playful wink. I look forward to it. Ameno giggles. B fist bumps Naruto. We hear anything, we'll shout. We'll overcome this trouble like all others no doubt. I sure hope so. Even with the info we got, we still know damn nothing about what's going on. Hey, don't sweat it, my man. We got some of the best minds ticking, so we leave it to them. And when they do their thing, we do ours, you feel me? Yeah, I guess you're right. Samui walks up to them, patting B on the back. As casual as always, B. Hey, you know me. B laughs. Samui nods to Naruto. It was good to see you again. You, too. Looks like being a sensei's going good for you. Naruto grins. Even though you were so awkward with Katori. Samui looks away. Yes, well, Genin are a bit easier to deal with. I do admit I'll miss this when they all become Chunin. Then you could take on another team, right? Maybe. We'll see. Who knows, next time my students will have to fight yours. Samui smiles. Ha, just don't count on winning then, too. Naruto declares. Katori, Yakimaru, and Shoto are only gonna get stronger from now. I look forward to it. Kashiwama firmly shakes Matsu's hand. All right, I permit you to visit again. Katori flicks his ear. Not your call to make. She then goes to hug Matsu. Does us being allies mean we can see each other often, maybe? Matsu wonders. I'll ask mom. Maybe you can come see the rain when it's less. 
Comedy Yakimaru jokes. Yeah, that, Matsu laughs. Shoto nods. I'd be interested in seeing it. Then it's a deal. Matsu smiles widely. Conan shakes Tsunada's hand. Thank you for this chance. Well, I owe it to him, after all. Sonata sighs. To Naruto? No. Jiraiya. Sonata clarifies. He believed in me when few else would. Gambled that I could become the kind of person that could be Hakage. If I don't give others the chance he gave me, then I wouldn't be able to look him in the eyes when I join him. Especially since I know he'd welcome you with open arms. I see. Conan smiles. He was certainly a different cut from others. He was. Sonata laughs. As the rain shinobi begin to leave, Conan glances back to the mist shinobi still getting everything in order. She smiles as her eyes meet Mei's, and the two give each other a silent goodbye. Sumeru throws his bag on his back. We're all ready, Hashikage. Nakago shakes his head. That's not my name, Sumeru, and you know that. The big villages can shove it. Sumeru waves dismissively. Mizura laughs nervously. I don't know if that's the attitude we should have now. Whatever my title is, what I do and what's most important do not change. Hashikage or not, I remain the same person. Don't get bogged down by formalities. Sumeru looks to the very familiar head of blonde hair approaching them. I won't let this stop me. I'm sure it won't. Naruto answers. Listen, man, this is way above me and even gra. The Hakage. But what we want to do doesn't change, does it? No, I guess not. Sumeru looks back to Nakago who said as much before. Whether it's Kage or village leader, I'll still get there before you, though. Then you'll have to bow down before me. That's not a thing. Nakago shakes his head, although his words fall on deaf ears. Careful. Next time you come here, my face'll be up on the mountain. You won't even need to bow cause I'll always be over you. Sumeru laughs and offers a hand. Sorry for how I was before. Naruto firmly returns the handshake. It's fine. Just as the Hidden Mountain group is about to leave, they're actually met by an unexpected sight. An official group belonging to the daimyo arrives, with four people carrying a palanquin. One lady Makoto, daughter of the former daimyo of the land of rice paddies, hops out and runs towards Kaitamaru, or as much as it can be called running, when you're dressed in the overly large kimono she wears. Kaitamaru furrows his brow. Lady Makoto? What brings you here? She runs into his arms. I couldn't wait for you to return. So I thought to come meet you. Kaitamaru smiles and takes her hand, kissing it. Your kindness warms my heart. Makoto pouts. Then maybe you should stop calling me lady. Your station is still above my own, I'm afraid. When we're among others, I must. He laughs. Makoto looks behind him to see the Hakage coming to greet her. Lady Hakage. It's a pleasure to meet you again. You, as well, Lady Makoto. We would have prepared to properly greet you had we known you were coming. We were only prepared for people to depart, not arrive. You needn't worry. I'm not here to stay. Besides, you saved the life of the one I love. She looks up lovingly to Kaitamaru. As far as I'm concerned, you needn't do anything else for me. Sonata smiles. I'm glad you're doing well after everything. We are. Kaitamaru nods. Better than ever. I don't want to keep you, Hakage, you have others to tend to. We'll be on our way. Safe travels. Sonata heads back to wrap things up as the mountain shinobi head for home. When all the village's groups leave, Sonata breathes a sigh of relief. Finally some peace and quiet. Naruto chuckles. You know, if being Hakage is too much for you. She flicks his forehead. Forget it, kid. You don't have the attention span just yet. Besides, if you become Hakage now, you won't be able to be Katori's sensei. Yeah, that's true. Guess it'll have to wait. Naruto nods. You know what doesn't need to wait, though? She drapes an arm over Naruto's shoulder. A nice drink. Your treat. Why is it my treat? He complains. Besides, should you be drinking right now? She eyes him over. Have you been hanging around Shizanu or something? Come on, you're a man now. A little alcohol in your system does wonders. Fine, but I'm not paying for yours. I know how much you drink. Sonata laughs. Now you're learning. Shinobi Union Meeting Hall for the leaders meeting, a new table was set for the Kage and leaders to sit, as the previous one was smaller, just enough for the representatives of the five founding villages. Now, that larger table remains in place for the expanded union. Hinata Hayuga of the Hidden Leaf. Tamari of the Hidden Sand. Itten of the Hidden Stone. Kiri of the Hidden Mist. Karui of the Hidden Cloud. The original five still have their seats and are still placed next to each other as they were before. The five new seats besides them are now occupied by the new representatives. 
Ryusui of the Hidden Rain, an older man of light brown hair kept under his bandana and black goatee. Keegan of the Hidden Waterfall, a man of brown curly hair. Sasama Fuma of the Hidden Mountain, a young woman of long orange hair. Sarara of the Hidden Frost, an older woman of long flowing silver hair. Mizura of the Hidden Star, a young man of dull purple hair. Ryusui looks around with a sheepish grin. Well, I didn't think I'd go from prisoner to hotshot. This is quite the honor. He laughs. Keegan raises a brow. Prisoner? Ah, yeah, well, you see, when Master Jureya infiltrated the Hidden Rain a couple years ago to get intel on Lord Payne, he took me prisoner. It's actually quite the honor now that I think about it, haha. <laughs> Ryusui explains. Hinata looks over everyone gathered. Whatever our past circumstances, I'm glad we could come to where we currently are. I know this will take some getting used to, but we're all here to assist each other and work together. So if there are any questions, please never hesitate to ask. She gives a bright smile. Now, let's commence today's meeting. End of chapter 49 Trivia Keegan is one of Fu's teammates in In Naruto's Footsteps. The Friends' Paths. Naruto Shippuden Episodes 394-413